Hello, NAPI members and flight instructors. This is John Niehaus, Director of Program Development for the National Association of Flight Instructors. I'd like to welcome you to another edition of the NAPI More Right Rudder podcast, the podcast for flight instructors on the go. And today is a special episode. I have a, uh, a guest, and my guest is a NAFI board member, um, and his name is Dr. Victor Vogel. Now, Dr. Victor Vogel is uh, a medical oncologist. He is a CFII, um, and uh, in his uh, um, medical life, he specializes in uh, cancer, specifically breast cancer. And um, so he has transitioned uh, to also specialize in airplanes, which is great. So what we're going to talk about today, and you may recognize uh, Mr. Vogel here because uh, he has done a couple of our PDP courses. Um, and uh, I think it's, uh, Victor, I think it's been a couple of the courses that are most talked about. So congratulations on uh on, on doing that, you did uh, medical factors or aeromedical factors and pilots and medications. So I think we're going to expand upon those and, uh, and welcome to the podcast. Thanks, John. Glad to be here. So what would you like to talk about uh, specifically that sort of uh, goes beyond what you, uh, what you mentioned in those courses? Well, one thing I've always been impressed by and increasingly impressed by as a flight instructor is that each and every time we get into an airplane or before we get into an airplane, we are required by regulation to self-certify our health and to make sure that we are um, fit to fly. Um, and you, we don't have the, the luxury that the, um, the military has of having a flight surgeon who can check us over and make sure we're ready to go. And we don't have the medical officers that an airline or perhaps some corporate departments have. So each and every flight, we have to ask ourselves, are we ready to go? Are, are we healthy from a, a mental and emotional and a physical perspective? Um, are we taking any new medicines? Have we had any recent uh, medical procedures that would in any way interfere with our ability to safely conduct a flight? Um, so we can talk a little bit about that and how, how we should go about doing that. Yeah, I, I think that that's a great plan. And, and I also am always amazed by how many hats flight instructors have to wear, because not only do we have to sort of self-certify, but we also have to observe, you know, our students and, and figure out, are they okay? Uh, because a lot of times they're not going to necessarily be forthcoming with that information. And it might just be somebody that you've never met before. You might just be doing a flight review for somebody or an insurance checkout. And somehow you've got to make that snap judgment. And, and that's tough. Yeah, it can be. And, and the other thing I emphasized in our, um, our uh, PDP courses uh, for NAFI was um, the notion that uh, in the um, airman certification standards for both the private certificate and a commercial certificate, there is a requirement that the airmen be able to discuss and identify air medical factors that could impact on the safety of flight. And I wanted to emphasize in, in those lectures that, that this is something that flight instructors, while certainly few flight instructors are like me and also are physicians, but there is adequate literature that you can, we can point our learners to and our, our pilots who are coming in for IPCs or uh, flight reviews, we can point them to those FAA publications and say, there are some things that you ought to be aware of, things that can affect the safety of flight and your health, and, and things that you ought to pay attention to, not only from a regulatory standpoint, but also simply from a from a safety standpoint. And that, that range of things is extensive. It includes what medications can you safely take? How does hypoxia affect pilots, particularly as we age? How does nighttime affect our vision and our, the presence of illusions? And, and what um, sorts of uh, uh, spatial disorientation uh, effects can be brought about by things like hypoxia or normal flight or can be worsened by medication. So those are all things that I, I think um, we need to emphasize both to our 
our certified pilots, our learner pilots, and to our fellow flight instructors that this is something that occasionally, periodically, we just need to raise pilots' awareness and then to emphasize, I hope I'm not sounding repetitive, but to have pilots with each and every flight say, am I okay from all these various perspectives? Am I okay to fly today? Well, I, I completely agree. And, and I love, uh, at least from the, the podcast hoster standpoint, I love the idea that there's a mountain of content because that keeps, uh, <laughs> that keeps us going. But, uh, you know, if we wanted to single out a few specific things um, that either sort of pilots and instructors don't understand, or maybe they think they understand. And, you know, <laughs> from your medical standpoint, you go, nope, you don't actually get it. Uh, what are a couple of things that, uh, um, that you think are, are worth mentioning today? Yeah, I think one of the things that we emphasized in, um, in pilots and medications, and this was part of a, um, a FAST team, an FAA FAST team uh, presentation that I did first a couple of years ago and did this at uh, Air Venture last year, is this notion of pilots taking over the counter medications. When we see our AME every year, every two years, or if we're on basic med, we see our physician only every five years, um, we, we know about and, and we tend to report um, the prescription medicines we might be on. But what about those over-the-counter medications that we may have just initiated yesterday or last week for a whole raft of uh, symptoms and um, and we take these medicines. And one of the things that FAA wants pilots to be aware of is they should read um, the instructions that come with over-the-counter medications, that is medications that do not require a prescription. And they should look at what we call the dosing interval. So if it says, take this medicine four times a day, well, that would mean the dosing interval is every six hours. And then FAA has a rule that says, well, in order to be safe to fly, after you take this medication the last time, wait five dosing intervals. Mm -hmm. So if it's four times a day, every six hours, well, five times that is every 30 hours. So if I took the medicine yesterday morning, I'm not really safe to fly from a five dosing interval perspective until late the next afternoon of the following day, because 30 hours is, is not just the next morning. It's the next morning plus six hours. So those kinds of things are, are very important. And the other thing that we talked about was um, being aware of possible drug interactions. So let's say I'm taking um, uh, an FAA approved prescription medication, but now you know I've got some sinus infection or I've got a sore throat or something and I go to the drugstore and I take another medication. What if there's what we call drug interaction? You, you, you take two medicines together and the two of them can affect each other. So one of the things we ask pilots to do is if you're adding a new medication, either a new prescription medication or an over-the-counter medication, ask your pharmacist, particularly retail pharmacists in all the major retail chains have programs on computers where they can input two drugs and they can tell you whether there's any interaction between those two drugs um, that might potentiate or diminish the effects of one of the drugs. And we're particularly concerned about drugs that may cause um, sleepiness um, or you know, impaired consciousness um, or impaired reaction time. Mm -hmm. And some of these drug interactions can, can result in those things. And there is some data to suggest, although the data is not complete, um, that many episodes of spatial disorientation may be preceded by some sort of medical action and medical effect um, either from an illness or a medication or the effect of the medication on the pilot or of the illness on the pilot. Um, and, you know, the, the top 10 causes of accidents still include things like spatial disorientation and controlled flight into terrain and, you know, um, BMC and IMC and all of those things. And what we want to be sure is that we're doing things medically um, to maximize the pilot's health and efficiency and wellness, if you will, and look for those things that might impair um, their performance from a, from a medical perspective. Yeah, it's interesting. I think uh, uh, a lot of people don't know the five times the dosing rule, but 
I also have to imagine, and I hope it's not the case, um, and, and I'd love to hear potentially an opinion from you, but do you think that that's one of those things where people may know that they're supposed to wait that long, but they go, ah, you know, I took a, I, I took a Tylenol, you know, eight hours ago and, and I'm not flying until tomorrow morning and I'm supposed to wait 30 hours, but I'm fine. There's nothing like, do you, do you think that people are sort of ignoring some of that because um, they, they're just reckless or like, what's the opinion? Well, I, I wouldn't want to accuse them of being reckless, but they may be unaware. Yeah. Um, and, you know, a couple of years ago, um, Michael Berry was the uh, federal air surgeon at the time. And for years, FAA was unwilling for many reasons, perhaps for medical legal reasons, for um, I don't know what their reasons might have been, but they did not publish a list of drugs that were safe to fly with or drugs that you should not fly with. And about two years ago, they, they came out with a, a list that you can look up on FAA.gov under a medical certification. And there's a list of things that you can safely take and things that would impair you. And I was surprised when I looked at that list because there's some things there that aren't intuitive. For example, we know that many people take melatonin to help them sleep at night. And I thought, well, a drug that helps you sleep, surely you wouldn't want to fly the morning after you took melatonin, but actually it's on the safe to fly list. Um, and so melatonin is okay. Whereas very common medication, a, a drug generically called diphenhydramine and um, brand name, a name that everybody knows is a drug called Benadryl. And, and Benadryl or diphenhydramine is in many, many over-the-counter cold remedies and, um, and uh, you know, allergy medications and so forth. And it's definitely on the do not fly list because it's, it's sedating. And now you can look up on the FAA website um, and get this list. It's in a PDF file and you can look and see, well, if I'm taking this medicine, is it okay? Or if it's on the don't, don't fly list, it's, it's not okay. Um, and then the other thing we need to encourage pilots to do is, you know, we, we all see, especially us <clears throat> mature pilots, <laughs> you're getting a little older, we, we may see physicians for various things in between our visits with our aviation medical examiner and if we are prescribed a new medication that we didn't report on our, on our medical when we saw our AME, um, we should probably give the AME a call or, or send him a, an email or, or ask his staff to, to ask him or her, um, gee, I'm getting this new medication um, for this condition and is it okay um, for, for me to fly? Or, or I've been diagnosed with something new. I have some new condition and some things are on the do not fly list because they're medical conditions and not because you're taking a medication necessarily. Now, some of them are obvious, you know, things that are very serious like stroke or heart attack or a, a new cancer diagnosis, those will ground you for a while. And if you have something like that, it, it's pretty obvious. You ought to check in with your AME and, and, ask and the AME can guide you as to when it would be safe to return to flight. But um, for some other things, well, maybe, maybe not so clear. I mean, what if, what if I have a, a fracture? What if I fracture a finger? You know, when, when, can, I, when can I go back to flying if I had a, a fractured finger or, um, you know, some infection? You know, well, what about if I had COVID? Um, when, and, but I'm well now and I'm back to work. Is it okay to go uh, fly now? And, and those are things that if we have those kinds of events in between our visits to our AME, we, we ought to check with the AME and say, hey, this happened. I had this surgery. I had this procedure. I had this diagnosis. I've got a new medication. Is it okay for me to continue to fly? Um, and I think uh, sometimes we, we don't necessarily think about those new events. And for pilots on basic med, you know, that may be a five-year uh, interval between uh, visits to a physician. Um, for most pilots or many pilots, it's, it's a two-year interval. Some of us are on one-year intervals and many are on six-month intervals. But the, the important thing is if there's changes in between these visits or if you see new physicians, um, it, it's a good idea to communicate with the uh, AME and, and ask, is this okay? 
Um, and is there anything special I need to do um, to keep me safe for flying? As a physician, I'm sure you've probably encountered this plenty of times, but do you find that people don't do that because they're afraid of hearing what the answer might be? Yeah. Um, you don't want to report a new drug or a new condition because you say, darn, if I report that, they may ground me. Well, yes, but if that condition or medication or procedure that you had somehow impairs your flying ability, that's precisely what we want to know about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and I understand, believe me, I, I understand people's reluctance to hear bad news from a medical perspective. I, I get it. I've been dealing with that for 40 years, but um, it, it's, it's best to know. An, an ostrich approach is not the best strategy, and it's not the safest strategy. And for many of these things, the time you're um, away or, or, or unable to uh, fly is, is very limited. For example, I had a back operation um, six months ago, and you know, I checked with my AME and I said, hey, uh, what, how, how long do I have to wait? And he gave me a list of things. And, and essentially, after my one visit, one month visit with my back surgeon, and he said, you know, you're good to go. You're going back to work. You're, you're fine. I was able to fly again. So those kinds of things happen. And there may be a short term limitation, um, but it doesn't mean you're permanently grounded. But my, my hope is that pilots and CFIs will understand that, um, there may be a period of time when you need to be not flying, um, but that time hopefully is, is self-limited and short, and then you can get safely back to flying afterwards. And I think that's something that every pilot needs to be aware of and, and not be fearful that they're going to be permanently grounded, but certainly we want to identify situations in which we should be temporarily grounded. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the last thing we want anybody um, to, to do is be so afraid of what their AME might say, um, not knowing that it is for a good reason. Um, you know, we don't want somebody to avoid those situations and then get in an airplane and have a problem that could have been completely prevented had they, yeah. you know, taken yeah. a proactive approach. Not to mention the fact that, you know, I, I would imagine... It, it doesn't, uh, things don't look kindly on you if you uh, are not reporting these things, even if nothing happens. If somebody finds out, um, you know, that, that you've been flying compromised, I mean, that's a whole nother potential conversation. So, yeah, and I, I think perhaps some pilots think, well, who, who will know? Well, that, that's true with, with two exceptions. As you said, if you have an incident or an accident, um, th there's going to be a lot of probing and questions, and then somebody might know. But more importantly, I, I, I think it, it, we, we shouldn't just do this because of regulate. We should do this because, importantly, if you are impaired, that's something you want to know. And if your medication or procedure or condition or diagnosis impairs your ability to fly safely, then that's something surely you would want to know. Um, and you would want to know that about any pilot that your family or loved ones is flying with. Absolutely. So that, that's, that's really the awareness we're, we're trying to raise among people. Yeah. And John, can, not... I mention, can I mention a couple of other things? Uh, Absolutely. Um, you know, not only do we have to worry about, well, not worry, but consider um, medications and procedures and, and medical conditions. But what about things that affect us every day, like fatigue. Um, fatigue is a very serious um, impairing condition. And uh, there is a fair amount of data from NTSB and others um, that, that fatigue is involved with a fair number of aviation accidents. Um, and, and another thing, a, a, a quote drug we don't think about perhaps all the time because it's so socially acceptable is alcohol. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've all heard about the eight hour bottles of throttle rule but many have advocated that it shouldn't be eight hours from the last drink until you turn the ignition and start the engines. It should be eight hours from the last drink until you initiate flight planning before your next flight. Um, so that makes the interval even longer than eight hours. Um, and, and again, for things like sleep and emotional situations, uh, we, we need to always be aware that those kinds of 
work stresses, family stresses, life stresses, illness in a family member, all those sorts of things can impair our ability to fly safely. And that's kind of the awareness we want to enhance and improve and, and get pilots to think of on a, on a more regular basis. Because as I said, the NTSB accident data suggests and indicates that at least in a proportion of accidents, these sorts of medical factors are having an impact uh, on the uh, on the risk and maybe causal in some instances. Yeah, I mean, I can I can personally attest to to fatigue. It's scary how it creeps up on you. Um, I uh, in my other world, um, I uh, used to fly one thirty five, and it's busy right now. It's really busy right now, and um, we had had a long rotation. And it was on my last day of my active rotation before taking several days off. And I remember this was, uh, this was still, I think I was still a first officer at the time. Um, but, uh, I remember talking to the captain and saying, look, you know, I'm okay. I've sort of done my, what I think is the, a decent self-assessment and I think I'm okay, but I'd like to have my flying done in the first couple legs. Cause we were basically going to go and, and uh, I think we were flying down to Augusta for the masters. And then we were going to head up to Canada, drop some passengers off and come back. And uh, so did the first two legs and we were going to sit in Augusta. And I remember taking off out of Augusta, heading to Toronto. And all of a sudden I just started messing up radio calls and I I'm usually kind of right there with the airplane or trying to be in front of the airplane in this particular case, like I'm falling further and further behind. And there really was no um, precursor to it. It was just, I was fine. And then all of a sudden I wasn't. And I just remember looking at my, at the, the co-pilot that I was with. And I just said, I think I'm getting fatigued. Um, you know, I'm not sure that I'm safe anymore and I'm glad I'm not actually flying. I mean, I had the luxury of basically swinging the gear and running the radios. Um, but in a single pilot situation, I could totally understand how that happens and you don't know it until you're sort of knee deep in it going, Oh my gosh, what do I do now? Yeah. I don't want to tell medical war stories, but uh, you know, 40 years ago when I was a, uh, a medical resident, um, in training, we did um, many, many consecutive hours. Sometimes we were on call and in the hospital 36 hours with, with no sleep. Um, and that was kind of, you know, a, a badge of honor and it was a rite of passage. And then in the, in the mid to early to mid 1980s, um, the graduate medical education committee started asking important questions like, well, do these sleep deprived residents who are in the hospital taking care of sick patients, are, are they safe to do that? And they started looking at outcomes and incidents in the hospital. And lo and behold, we should not be surprised that they learned that fatigued doctors make mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, they, they document, and some of these mistakes are serious, even fatal. And so the graduate medical education in the United States came to a, a, a sort of awakening in the late 1980s, early 90s, and said, well, there should be limits on the number of duty hours that a, a physician serves. And, you know, I, I had many nights when I was on for 36 hours. In other words, a 24-hour day followed by another 12 hours in the next day before I could go home. And then we came to the realization that, you know, 24 hours is probably the maximum. Hmm. Um, and, and we started putting restrictions on how long resident physicians could, could be on uninterrupted duty. Um, and those, those studies of fatigued physicians were, were eye openers to many of us. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, well, we're all aware that there are duty hours, as you are very well aware in the 135 world, about how many hours you can serve in a week or a day mm -hmm. or a month. Um, and, and I think um, while few private pilots or pilots with commercial certificates who are flying a Part 91, we, we don't fly those kinds of duty hours, but we can certainly work 
long work days and then be looking at a two or three hour flight at the end of a long work day into the night. And maybe there's an instrument approach at the end and, and those kinds of things. Again, we, we need to raise awareness about the real risks that are involved with even that short-term uh, fatigue that can occur with trying to fly at the end of a, of a long work day. And even mental work. I mean, it, you know, it, it, sure, it's, it's fatiguing to do physical work, but mental work, um, the kind that pilots do or the physicians do or lawyers or attorneys or CPAs or any professional person, those kinds of days are fatiguing. And I think we need to, again, raise awareness uh, about that kind of, uh, of risk. Um, and, you know, it's, it's part of the I'm safe checklist because fatigue is, is on that list. And we need to ask pilots to, to be aware of that and know that, you know, when they're fatigued, they're, no matter how proficient and how current they are, they're just not going to do as well if they're fatigued. So has the medical community sort of given a list of things to watch out for? So, I mean, we all know what the word fatigue means, but it's really hard to define in yourself. Are there things that people can be looking for um, that maybe they um, should ask themselves prior to taking off? Yeah. It's the, the things that you started to point out, like, um, you know, um, do, do the radio communications start being, you know, a little less professional? Um, do you start overlooking things on the checklist? Um, is your pre-flight preparation not as stepwise and, and complete as it might be? And, and there, there are opportunities all along the, the way here to say, well, am I forgetting things? Uh, is, is my uh, performance even on the ground not what it usually is? And then, you know, I'm in the airplane and you know, I'm doing the startup procedure and I'm taxing and, and am I getting confused? Am I having a hard time communicating uh, and I'm overlooking and missing things? And all of those points along the continuum from flight planning to uh, pre-flight to walk around to start and taxi and departure, all of those places are opportunities um, for pilots to say, am I fit? Am I safe? And am I, and am I seeing indications to myself that there are suggestive things um, that indicate to me that maybe maybe I'm not good to go here. Well, what about from the CFI's perspective? You know, let's say I've got uh, four students sort of back to back to back. Uh, now, of course, uh, we want to encourage everyone to do sort of a, a pre and post brief with students. So, you know, during that pre brief, what can I be looking for in my students to maybe determine whether they're fatigued or not and yeah. you know as a result of them not wanting to tell me so i i think you know you, you don't want to make this a uh, you know an inquisition you don't want to make it right. sound like you know you're you're holding court but you know you just chat with the student and you ask them informally you know how are things going um how are you feeling what, what's going on at work have you anybody in your friends or family had covid have you been exposed i mean i have a student right now who we were supposed to fly this weekend and he called me up and said, no, I've been diagnosed with COVID. Well, okay. That's a, that's a red flag starter point. Right. Um, and you know, are, how's things, your, your family good, you, you feeling well, your wife and kids are fine. How's things at work? You're working on any big projects? Uh, what's your work schedule been like? And I think you, you can just go through um, those, those simple questions and, and ask people in, in a very directed way, ask students, learners, How's things going? And um, um, and you can tell pretty quickly. Uh, I'm sure you've seen it. Um, if somebody's fatigued, or they start missing things, or they they have to pause and and think about you know how they're remembering things, and their memory's impaired or slowed, and all of those are signs um, that you know maybe things well, this isn't the best day to fly. And you can see that also um, in in their uh, initial prep in the airplane you know are, are they are they missing things on the uh, on the startup checklist or are, are they missing things um, are they not paying attention um, during taxi and uh, departure preparation and so forth and I, I think there's signs along the way that we need to be aware of and then and ask you know are, are you feeling okay today are, are you really feeling uh, up to this or, or or should we you know perhaps reschedule 
Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that's that's something. And it doesn't have to be a long, extensive thing. And you know, after you do this a few times, you can tell pretty quickly whether whether somebody's up to the task. But but I think I think we should do that, and we we should be aware as flight instructors. We should keep our uh, antenna up uh, for things that may be uh, signals that uh, somebody's not fit to fly today. Yeah, you know, and and as we start to kind of wind things down here, um, I've got a question that uh, it's in reference to something we talked about earlier, which was the the medications. But are there sort of three different classifications of of medicines? And and what I mean by that is is those that you can take, uh, those that you can't take you know, and then go fly. And then those that sort of disqualify you all together. Is that a true statement? Yeah, you know, or? that's exactly, that's absolutely true. Okay. Um, so, so there are many medicines on the, you know, safe to fly list. I mean, for example, you mentioned Tylenol a little while ago, acetaminophen. You, you can take that and that's not an impairing drug. Now there are drugs that we also mentioned drugs like Benadryl, diphenhydramine, a lot of cold preparations. It's on the, you know, do, do the, uh, the five dosing interval wait time. Mm -hmm. And then there are a list of drugs, the AME have these lists and the F FAA website also has them, that if you're taking these drugs, you simply may not fly. Mm -hmm. um, and they include obvious things like anti-seizure medications, you know, <laughs> somebody who's having seizures and these meds. Yeah. So um, yes, there, there are those three categories of drugs, safe to use, use after a, a dosing interval delay and on the do not fly list. Um, and it's important to be aware of what those drugs are um, and to know that they're in different categories. And one drug we should probably mention before we end here, uh, John, is you know, the, the, um, the marijuana cousin called CBD. Um, and CBD um, is now available in many states um, and you can buy it over the counter without um, a prescription. Um, but CBD is an impairing drug. And because it's so widely used and so many people um, use it and they, they can go to stores and, and buy it without a prescription, they may feel that, oh, well, if, if, if that's how it's available, surely it must be safe. But it is not safe. And FDA, FDA has, FAA and FDA have made it very clear um, that, that CBD products, oils, oral, whatever, um, just simply should not be used. Um, by pilots. And I think those kinds of things, we also um, need to uh, make our learners and our certificated pilots aware of. Yeah. And, and sort of two questions. I mean, I guess one's sort of a statement, but um, a lot of that CBD stuff, I mean, there may be some that go through rep reputable companies and are, are maybe approved by um, the FDA, but there seems to be so many of them out there because it's such a new market, exploding market that there's, you know, there's a lot of different kinds that not each one is made equally. I would imagine not that I've ever had any, but um, you know, it, it just seems like they're sort of popping up out of nowhere. And, and I doubt that any kind of regulation can keep up with the, um, the, the uh, purity or, or, you know, you understand what I'm saying, but the, yeah. How, how do you keep up with the, the amount of new companies and possibly new recipes and all that stuff? Yeah. And as you say, I mean, you know, if, if I go to the store and, and I, I buy a, a bottle of Tylenol that says there's 500 milligrams in each of these tablets or capsules, there's going to be 500 milligrams in each of those tablets. But with CBD, it's essentially viewed now in many states as a quote, natural product. So it's, it's not under the same kinds of FDA regulations, and as you point out, the, the content may vary greatly. Um, the other substances that are with the CBD, I mean, it may not be 100% pure, there may be other contaminants and so forth. And yeah, so all of those things are concerns, um, but the, um, the biggest concern is that, that it is clear, um, and FDA has made this very clear to the FAA, that the, CBD is an impairing substance, and it, it, it is simply not safe to operate in broad terms machinery, which of course includes aircraft, um, when somebody's taking or using CBD products. And I, I, I suspect, I don't know this, but I suspect there are pilots out there using CBD products and 
think it's totally safe and uh, the pilot is not aware and the CFI is not aware and, you know, the AME is not aware. And these things may not be reported even at the time, you know, we're, we're required by regulation to report all the things we're taking when we go um, for our medical exams with our AME. But it's pretty clear that many things are, are not reported. And there have been accident reports where it's clear after they do toxicology assessment uh, of an accident victim and find drugs and substances in their blood. And then they look at the drugs they reported to their AME and they're not reported. Um, so th these are the kinds of things that we need to bring to pilots awareness um, so that they know that uh, some of these things are just not safe. Yeah. And, and I guess my final question about that is for the proponents of CBD and, and, you know, there, there are certain things that uh, it does seem to help with people, you know, aches and pains and, and things like yeah. that yeah. because the product is so new, you know, is it possible that somewhere down the road, if you're looking at your crystal ball and I won't hold you to this, but uh, you know, do you think it, it, the FAA could ever change their, their stance on it? Do you think that there's ever a chance that somebody could potentially be able to use that as a, as a, you know, arthritis cream and then still be able to go fly? Well, that's a hard one. It, it would require the production of some controlled data. You'd, you'd have to observe and study people taking CBD over a period of time and observe them in various activities and have some sort of objective measure about their ability to perform activities, um, wh whether it impaired consciousness, alertness, uh, all those sorts of things, impaired memory. Um, and and it's, the, the thing is, it's very unlikely that those studies will ever be done because there's no motivation, certainly for the manufacturers to pay for those studies. And there's not sufficient funds in an agency like the FDA to pay for those studies. So very often um, you get anecdotal information and it's not completely, um, you know, doesn't cover all the possible um, side effects, ramifications, interactions with other drugs, medical conditions and so forth and on and on it goes. I mean, for, for example, some, some cancer patients take CBD for relief of many symptoms, you know, nausea, pain, whatever. Um, but it, it clearly has, significant side effect one of the things it causes is well known it it it, it increases fatigue mm -hmm. um and it can cause difficult symptoms like diarrhea and imagine you're a pilot flying and you're taking cbd and then you're afflicted with diarrhea that is not a good situation to have in the cockpit that um, is my own personal nightmare <laughs> yeah i mean that so the, these things are so obvious and, and they're, they're very practical, but sometimes they're simply overlooked and we need to continue to raise awareness about these things. Well, uh, you know, I, I think we, we ran the gamut today of, of uh, some really important subjects. Um, I, I think that uh, it's all great stuff to generate awareness. And, um, you know, Victor, I'd love to continue this conversation on, on future episodes of the podcast. In fact, um, you know, I, I think that there's a lot in the CFI community uh, where they would love to be able to sort of ask you questions. So um, yeah. I'm going to put it out there to our listeners. If you have questions for, uh, for Dr. Vogel, um, I know that I'm going to have him back, whether he wants to or not. And uh, so if you've got questions, send us an email to naffy at naffynet.org. And, uh, you know, on one of these future episodes, we'll try to maybe tackle some, uh, some questions from the CFI that uh, maybe they're afraid to ask others. No, that would be very, very helpful. I'd be glad to do that. And, and perhaps if the CFIs can ask these questions anonymously, it'll avoid embarrassment. Absolutely. Absolutely. You don't even need to tell us your name. You don't need to be a yeah. NAFI member. Um, yeah. Just uh, just send us your questions. We, we want to be able to use these things to, uh, to help the instructor and pilot community. And, uh, um, you know, I think that, uh, that we can do just that with... Uh, with your expertise. So um, just as a aside, if you're not a member of NAFI, we'd love to have you. Um, all you have to do is go to www.nafinet.org. If you haven't subscribed to this podcast, please do. You can do that on all major podcast forums, Apple, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, um, and any other ones that you can think of. It took me forever to sign us up for all of them. So <laughs> please sign up, please subscribe. And you can also, if you want to watch 
um, our conversation. You can uh, you can see this very same show on our YouTube channel. So just look up National Association of Flight Instructors. So anyways, Victor, thank you so much for your time. I can't wait to have you back and uh, we appreciate you very much. Well, let's do it again soon. I'll be happy to do it. 